We're glad you're here. And our portion of scripture today comes once again from Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And um, you'll probably recognize this as the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we already covered the Beatitudes, uh, the Blessings that are at the beginning of this portion. And we looked at uh, some verses having to do with the Christian's purpose and calling in this life that we might be salt and light uh, to a world that needs preserving and needs illumination and God has called us as his people to do so and we uh, discussed that uh, in, in the flow of uh, the needs of life uh, having to do with social justice and making sure that those who are in need are addressed according to their need and that as the people of God we take that calling upon ourselves and I want to say uh, in that thought of why should the government be the example of what God's purpose and will is in the world around us and we are called to be that example and I, I hope that that spoke loudly to you as we were discussing that subject, I, I realized that in the news media today, there are so many different perspectives and sometimes you hardly know what to think, but um, I, I hope that we're clear on what God has called us to do and has called us to be in this world that he's left us in uh, as a testimony. Uh, today, we're gonna deal with the Christian and the law. I know that for Two years, uh, Pastor Michael uh, discussed uh, living and understanding the law in the regard of our lives. And I'm, I'm certainly not going to go into that kind of detail because I've only got uh, about 45 minutes here. And I'm not going to try to cover all of those things. But there is a need for us to recognize the, the law of God. And we are familiar with the scripture that speaks of Christ being the end of the law. I, I, I guess I should tell you that that even implies that he's the fulfillment of the law of God in our lives. And that that leaves us as his people uh, in a true sense free from the law. Uh, however, let me clarify, that doesn't mean that we don't follow uh, that we aren't called upon to keep the law of God and to be obedient to God's commandments. I, I think it's important for us to, to recognize that, that uh, the Ten Commandments are still in place. The Word of God is very clear that they are the established righteousness of God. And if you're looking for a guideline for life, uh, I've said it before, uh, this is the do's and the don'ts of living and particularly for us as Christians. We are called upon to follow the law of God and to live according to his commandments and according to his will. So probably the best thing for us to do before we get into Matthew chapter five is to go to the book of Exodus. Let's do that for just a minute. Exodus, and uh, I, I should probably ask, where, where do we find the 10 commandments? in the book of Exodus. Anybody got that down right away? Somebody want to just uh, offer that? The chapter? Chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. Thank you. Somebody listened in Sunday school class. <laughs> okay. Or they're quick on the Google finger. Exodus chapter 20, and let's read the word of God. The Lord spoke all of these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God which brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other God before me. Verse 3, that's the first of the Ten Commandments. You shall not make unto you any graven image or any likeness of anything that's in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. I hope that explains some of those New Testament verses about above the earth, in the earth, and under the earth. You shall not bow down yourself to them. You shall not serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of those that hate me, 
and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold that person guiltless who takes his name in vain. Wow. Um, a commandment here that has a bit of a hang on uh, regarding responsibility and that you don't carelessly use the name of the Lord like we hear in the world around us today. I mean, OMG is just, uh, it's, it's just a byword on the internet and as we use our phones and so don't do that. That's, that's calling upon the name of the Lord unnecessarily and without meaning or purpose and the Lord will not hold them guiltless that take his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And the scripture goes into some detail. You shall work six days. And you have to kind of ask the question, doesn't the Lord believe in a seven-day work week? Well, uh, Scripture says you shall work six days. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but there is a need for us to recognize that out of every seven days, there is to be a day of rest. I, I like the idea that God understands our needs when it comes to stress and strain and burnout and all of the things that happen in our world today. I used to work in a facility where they they went 12 hours a day and they shifted that around and I listened to young people, people that were less than half my age and they were just worn out. They weren't getting their needs of rest and relaxation met, even with the 15 hour, or 15, yeah, 15 hour, 15 minute break and so forth. 15 hour break, I can take that. But on the seventh day is the Sabbath, notice, of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, nor your son, your daughter, your manservant, your maidservant, your cattle. They get a day away from the plow. Uh, I don't know what we do with uh, mechanical equipment today. Uh, I guess the John Deere sits in the garage. But um, nor the stranger that lives within your town. It's understood here that God has ordained a day of rest. And I, I know there's arguments about this, and we have friends that are from the denomination called the Seventh-day Adventist, and I don't have a fight to pick with them. One of my best friends is a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. And by the way, they go to church on Saturday rather than on Sunday, and he and I have discussed this, and he goes, I don't get the day off, but I let him know that I believe that God's purpose is for us to work six days, to be able to have a day of rest, a day of relaxation, a day of refreshment and reflection. We've got a week behind us to take a look at our accomplishments and a week before us where we can make our planning and our scheduling as we spoke in Sunday school this morning according to the will of God. And we ought to say if the Lord will, we shall do, we shall live and do this or that, okay? For in six days, here's the reason behind this, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and he rested the seventh day, and so the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor thy father and thy mother, that you're, okay kids, honor thy father and thy mother, I know you're going like, oh man, no, no. That your days may be long upon the land which the Lord has given you. There's a blessing connected here with honoring your father and your mother. Now, when we get to the New Testament and other portions, we read children obey your parents. And I know that as kids, we squirm under that. But these laws, these commandments that we have before us here today are for your good and for your blessing. And I'm going to suggest, as I look into your faces today, you are fortunate, you are blessed today. I know your parents, and God has blessed our church with some wonderful parents. And I've talked to some of you about your responsibilities and 
particularly responsibilities in the church that you don't overdo it in such a way that you neglect your family. There's, there's a need for us to have priorities established that in a proper way we might put Christ first in all of these things that we deal with in our day-to-day -day living. You shall not kill. Uh, actually, do no murder. You shall not commit adultery. That has to do with violating the vows of marriage and the maintenance of the family unit, particularly the family leadership. You shall not steal. You shall not lie. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Verse 17 says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, his wife, his manservant, his maidservant, his livestock, um, his possessions, anything that belongs to your neighbor. You and I are to see those things, and when our neighbor gets a new car and calls us out to take a look at it, it's easy to say, oh, wow, it would be so nice to have a, a new Camry or whatever it is that he just pulled in with, maybe a BMW, I don't know. But although we can admire those things and we see them as desirable, we are to keep our hearts in check as to our lust and desire for things that do not belong to us. And uh, these commandments were written on tablets of stone by the finger of God. Can, can I say to you, and I, I don't want this to sound, I, I know I've said it before, but these stand true. And these are the commandments of the Lord. Uh, again, they are the Ten Commandments, not the Ten Suggestions. And for those of you that, if someone were to say, and I, I'm going to speak to my Christian brothers and sisters right now, if someone were to say to you, well, how are you doing in your walk with the Lord? How is your life coming along? Are there issues that you struggle with and so forth? And they say, well, are you living according to God's purpose and will? And you might even respond with something like this. Well, I, I really try to keep the Ten Commandments. And the question may come up, well, how are you doing? And you may respond, well, I'm not doing too, I, I get this, I'm not doing too bad, I'm not doing too bad for the average Christian. <laughs> Can I submit to you today that the averages are low, okay? You wouldn't settle for average in any other area of life. If somebody said, what kind of a mother are you? If someone were to say, uh, back in the days when I worked regularly as a mechanic, what kind of a mechanic are you anyway, Brother Dave? I, I wouldn't want somebody to say, oh, he's average. Or he's not bad for the average mechanic. I, if you were to say that when it came to me as a father that I wasn't bad for the average father or I wasn't, I was the average father, those were almost fighting words. I, I saw myself in the, in the column of excellent and yet, when it comes to our walk with the Lord and our obedience to his word, so many of us are careless in the regard of how we follow God's plan and his design, as well as the parameters, the guidelines for our behavior. Um, and let me just say to you that uh, in the regard of, of following these Ten Commandments, um, this isn't something that you get rewarded for doing. I, there's people that want the proverbial cookie for keeping the Ten Commandments. But let me say, the Ten Commandments are what is expected. Ouch, you might say. No, to follow God's commandments and to live according to his word and his command is the best thing that you can do because it brings blessing to you as it brings blessings to others living in obedience unto the Lord. So let's see these in their proper perspective. Now as Jesus deals with them in Matthew chapter 5, you might say, okay, but isn't he kind of 
changing? Isn't he adjusting? Isn't he? And you may have a variety of questions as to Jesus' take, Jesus' perspective on the law of God. Well, let me say it like this. In Moses' day, the people of Israel, they also looked at the Ten Commandments, they looked at the law of God, and they felt it was necessary for them to develop a commentary, for them to reflect and perhaps even define, maybe redefine, the Ten Commandments. You should see what they did in the regard of the Sabbath day. The day that God blessed them with rest and relaxation. They turned the Sabbath day into a day of strenuous work, having to do with what you don't do or can't do on the Ten Commandments. Up, 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 up. And this, they took all the fun out of having a day off. And by the way, one of the things that we do as sinners, and I, I, I probably will mention this more than one, is once, isn't it strange how we take what doesn't work and we somehow make what doesn't work work? Uh, and in fact, some of us go to an extreme where we try to develop a plan where we can break the rules and still win the race, still win the game. And... Um, that's why in sports they have, I mean, they have these people wearing, you know, special equipment and gear and shirts and you recognize them as referees and umpires and so forth because they maintain the rule of the game. We've even got cameras for instant replay and so forth. And can I say to you that uh, many of us call upon the judge of all the earth for instant replays hoping that he will approve where we have violated his clear commandment. And yeah, as violators of the law, we, we try to have an argument with the law enforcer. And uh, those of you that drive, you maybe tried that with a policeman as he pulled up behind you and you rolled down your window and uh, he asked you a question or he made a statement regarding your driving ability or habits and you challenged him, um, he understands the rules of the road. Uh, there's, there's a book out there having to do with the, the laws of the state of Michigan regarding your driving. And so, um, as violators, as sinners, uh, we have this crazy um, desire to defend ourselves and argue with the Lord and with the judge of all the earth. So in the Old Testament, yes, they they tried to redefine and, and such. Uh, they added this and, and changed that and tried to make some of these. I, how, how much simpler can you make it than thou shalt and thou shalt not? <laughs> what don't you understand about that? Okay. Is, is that what Jesus is doing here in Matthew chapter 5? Um, let's take a look at it. Let's look at Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to pick up in chapter 5 of Matthew where we left off in Exodus chapter 20. We stopped at verse 17. Let's begin at verse 17 in Matthew chapter 5. Do not think that I have come to destroy the law and the prophets. Jesus makes it very clear as he's teaching that he is not there to discard the law and the prophets, the writings of those holy men of God that were moved by the Holy Spirit. He said, I'm not here to destroy those things that they established as the word of God and as the law of God. But I have come, rather than to destroy, I have come to accomplish, I have come to fulfill. For so be it, I tell you, that until heaven and earth pass away, not one iota or one point shall pass away from the law until everything is fulfilled. So 
there goes your argument and perhaps even your understanding of other scriptures that may imply changes in the regard of this established law that God has. Whoever then diminishes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others the same thing, in other words, you can get away with this or this isn't, that isn't so important anymore, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever does and whoever teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that if your righteousness, your good behavior, if your standard of living doesn't exceed the nitpicking rules and regulations of the religious Pharisees, you shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. So in other words, those people of Jesus' day that were so strict and, and they were going around with uh, 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 and, and pointing out where you came short and how you misapplied and how you didn't understand and they tried to bring you under the grips of bondage to the law, Jesus said, as good as they may appear or even try to appear, your righteousness, your standard of behavior and living needs to excel, needs to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. And then he takes certain of the law, certain ones. By the way, he doesn't address all ten. Uh, some people say, well, you know, Jesus never said anything about keeping the Sabbath. Oh, oh, oh wait a minute. Uh, wasn't it Jesus who, in the regard of violations of the Sabbath, said, you need to understand that as the Lord, I am the Lord of the Sabbath also. So this idea of six days of labor and a day off uh, is not discounted, is not changed, is not certainly not discarded by Jesus. And so I want to say to you that as we go to verse 21 and we read Jesus' uh, comments about murder, uh, as we take a look at his discussion of divorce and adultery and so forth, uh, he is not redefining the law of God. He's refining the law of God. He's making sure that we understand clearly the purity of what God has required and the commandments that God has given for us, his people, to guide our lives. Verse 21, you've heard that it was said by those of old, the ancients, do not murder, and whoever murders is liable to the judgment. But I tell you that whoever is angry with his brother without a reason, without a cause, is liable to the judgment, and whoever calls his brother the brainless one, okay, is liable to the Sanhedrin, to the local authorities, and I'm going to use the word moron here. Whoever says you moron shall be liar, shall be liable to the fires of Gehenna, the never-ending fires of God's judgment. If then you offer your gift upon the altar where you require, recall that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar, get things straight, be reconciled with your brother, and then come to God with your gift. Wow. Um, that's uh, quite clear. Uh, that is an interesting refinement of do no murder. Verse 25, be agreeable with your accuser quickly while you're on the pathway with him. You don't want your accuser to deliver you to the judge, for the judge then to deliver you to the officer and the officer to put you in prison. I need to tell you, Jesus says, so be it. You will not be released from your charges until you pay the last cent. Um, if you're wondering what that's all about, um, that, that says that it, 
it's okay and even recommended by the Lord that in the issue of civil judgment, if you can settle out of court rather than putting it into the hands of the authorities, by all means do so. I have had situations in my life where this verse has come to me clearly by the Holy Spirit of God where I had individuals that wanted to sue me or bring charges and so forth against me where I realized there was a need to go to them and to work this thing out and to settle out of court rather than to allow the judgment imposed or implied against me to be in the hands of someone else. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Jesus recommends settling out of court. It can save you a lot of fees. Um, you don't have to call 1-800-CALL-SAM or some of the, no. Uh, there are things that you and I can take care of ourselves and prevent, as we sometimes say, our dirty laundry from hanging out in the sight of all the public to see. Verse 27. You've heard that it was said of old, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that whoever looks upon a woman lusting over her already commits adultery with her in the heart. Now, I need to say this to our young people as well as to our entire audience. There's a vast difference between what goes on in your heart and what you might go further and do in your actions. And all of us have had thoughts race through our mind. All of us have had temptations that have come before us in the regard of every issue of life, including moral purity, but stop it in the regard of that lust that takes place in your heart rather than going further and carrying that into an action that affects not only what goes on in your mind and in your heart, but in the regard of the well-being and violation of another person. There's a world of difference between sinning in your heart, sinning in your thoughts, sinning in your head, and sinning in actual behavior. And by the way, as we've read in James about temptation, there is a need for us to see that temptation in itself is something that takes place in the realm of our lust, but it doesn't have to become a sin. And so our young people today need to realize that in this world that talks about the issues of human behavior and particularly physical lust, there is a need for us to realize today that the flesh for us as Christians, needs to come under the direct control of the Holy Spirit of God that we do not follow those temptations of the flesh. So if your right eye strays, uh, remove it and cast it from you. Now this is extreme, but nevertheless, some of these things that are a problem for us as Christians and a problem that the world, I mean, the, the world, they recognize, and you need to understand also, uh, some, I mean, sin is fun. I know, some of you are looking at me and you're going like, okay, Pastor, you better explain that. Um, the Bible speaks of the pleasures of sin, but it lets us know that they are for a season. The pleasures of sin don't last and there's a right way for us to enjoy those things that God has given to us for physical pleasure and for other pleasure in our living. And it's when we violate the law of God and we do them outside of his purpose and of his clear commandment that we find that the violation and the sin we commit goes from pleasure into a situation of guilt and judgment. I heard somebody say, and I, I, I have to say this, uh, they said, people who say that sin isn't any fun, uh, there's one of two things going on here. Either they're lying or they don't know how to do it. 
Sin is fun. But the consequence of sin and the issue of guilt that God establishes in our hearts by the very things of nature around us. Romans chapter 1 makes it very clear that the issues of nature teach you and I about the guilt that happens when we violate God's laws. I, uh, I know that Thomas Aquinas, um, he taught that uh, nature was a path to goodness in living. I disagree with him. I know he had a lot of good things to say, and as a Christian philosopher, and as a man of God, uh, there are things that he said that I think are precious and that we could follow, but that's not one. Uh, he lived a rather monastic life. He lived in a monastery. I'll be very frank with you. He needed to get out more. And he would find that as he went out into the world, these things that he would see done in nature and done naturally by mankind are an issue that bring to our hearts the problem of guilt that points us to a Savior and remind us that we have a very dark world around us and that same darkness will penetrate and permeate our very being. God's word is very clear that the issue of guilt that we see because of living in the flesh and doing, as the world says, what comes naturally, or the other little rule that they go by, everybody's doing it. Well, the very judgment that come upon them, the very negative result that happens in the lives of the average person on the street will happen in your life because the wages of sin is death. And just remember that because you don't get paid the day that you sin, payday is coming. And as unbelievers, they will experience the judgment of God for their sin, sin that Christ died for upon the cross, they will experience judgment for that eternally but as believers, I want you to know that Romans chapter 6 and 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Yes, that is a principle, but it's written to believers, and it's a principle that applies to your life and mine if we choose to go against the law of God and live in disobedience to him. Verse 31, it was said that whoever divorces his wife, let him give her an actual paper, an actual uh, certificate of divorcement. But I tell you that whoever dismisses his wife except for the accusa accusation of sexual sin, improper living in the regard of morals, causes her to commit adultery, puts her in the situation, and whoever shall marry the dismissed one commits adultery. And you might say, well, then that means that anyone who has been divorced could never remarry. That's not what it says. But it does say that the one who goes beyond their marriage vow and violates it by being joined to another is the one who breaks the vow of the marriage and is the one guilty of the announced and pronounced adultery. Verse 33, again, you heard that it was said, perjure not, but perform your oaths to the Lord. I tell you, don't make any oaths at all. Uh, you can say too much. You can make commitments that you're not able to keep. Don't, and again, in the regard of using the Lord's name in vain, don't say, by God, I'll do it. That means that if you don't come through, God will. You can't do that. You don't make vows by heaven. He says, don't make any oaths at all, not by heaven because it's God's throne, neither by the earth because it's the footstool for his feet, nor by Jerusalem because it's the city of the mighty king. I, I had to snicker uh, in, when, when 
President Bill Clinton was talking about dividing the city of Jerusalem into three parts, I, I, I thought, whoa, 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 wait a minute. That city doesn't belong to you or any other worldly ruler. That is the city of the great king. Jerusalem belongs to Jesus, and it's going to be one. It's going to be a city of unity and harmony and God's eternal love and power and grace. Neither shall you swear by your head because you're not even able to change one hair, white or black. And um, I know somebody says, well, they've got just for men gel. And some of us are familiar with that. But uh, I want you to know that the gray comes right back in. Are we, you say amen. <laughs> I was waiting for an amen. <laughs> oh, amen. <laughs> but just let your yes be yes and your no be no. Because if you go beyond that, it's evil. Wow. Um, in other words, Jesus is not redefining. He's refining the law and saying that you and I need to understand that all those areas where we would like to provide and make wiggle, wiggle room, he takes the wiggle out of it and lets us know that thou shalt and thou shalt not are the very clear ordinances of God. You've heard it said that you give an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, do not oppose those who are malicious, but whoever strikes you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. Well, that's a tough one. Um, I suppose there's young men in our audience today that are saying like, that's not gonna happen. Uh, I've had people say to me, uh, you know, I went through high school and we learned about the rule of you know, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, and slapping on the cheek. And uh, if you turn the other one, you got slapped there too, and we're not going there. Um, Jesus says no. And by the way, this is beautiful because this is the introduction of grace. Remember what we said the last time when we were together? That in John chapter 1, verse 17, John makes it very clear by the Holy Spirit that the law came by Moses, but grace coupled with truth. This is grace coming alongside the law and even though you receive poor treatment, even though someone violates your left cheek, um, if they violate both cheeks, um, you are to show grace. And I have to be honest with you today that if you take the Ten Commandments, and if you see them without the element of God's grace, and in the next verses, God's mercy and love, you can't survive the law of God. In fact, the Bible says the law was our schoolmaster, our school teacher to bring us to Christ. When we look at the Ten Commandments, when we look at the law of God, we realize our utter inability to live in perfect obedience to the Lord because those who will live by the law must do them. And we don't. So grace enters into the picture of the law. So whoever wants to sue you and take your vest, just... <coughs> Go ahead and give him your coat. And whoever compels you to go with them one mile, go two. Go two miles with them. Do not reject the person asking you to give or the one who seeks to borrow from you. There is a need for us to realize that all that we are, all that we have, is a gift from God anyway. And this doesn't mean to be foolish and let people take advantage of you. This is in the situation of need and an individual asking for something and perhaps imposing on you. But still, the need for us as God's people is to show grace. God will make sure you get a vest and a coat and you're going to do just fine. 
You've heard it said that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That sounds easy, doesn't it? But I tell you to love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Now this, as a literal biblicist, that doesn't mean that when somebody cusses you out, you say to them, God bless you, God bless you, be at peace. Uh, you can antagonize people with that. But there is a need for us in our hearts and in our attitudes, as well as our words, when cursing and condemnation come our way, to return blessing for the curse. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who abuse and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father in heaven, for he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. And you might complain that your birthday party got rained out, but the farmer next door is glad that he was able to put in his crop. And somehow God just works this all out. And you and I, as the people of God, learn what it is to say amen. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you receive? Oh, don't even the tax collectors, the, the, the public servants that we see as being unjust and, and dishonest, don't they do that also? And if you only greet your brothers, what are you doing that's exceptional? My goodness, again, even the tax collectors that are out there abusing people and misusing and overcharging, they do the same. So Jesus says, there's a need for us as his people to be perfect just as our Father in heaven is perfect. Are we going to struggle? Are we going to fail? Are there going to be times when in the best of our efforts and abilities, we throw our hands up and say, I can't do this? Of course. I, I love that little verse. I can't tell you where it is right now, but it says, He giveth more grace. And thank God that for all of our shortcomings, and we certainly have them, all of the situations where we find that even though we thought we could break the rules and win, we see ourselves in the losing column, there is a Savior who has won the victory for us, and His name is Jesus. And when you and I are repulsed by what is around us, we need to look within and see that same repulsive nature in ourselves and cry out to God, Lord, save me, give me strength, show your grace to me today because I can't do this on my own. That we might be perfect even as our Father in heaven is perfect. Are you getting this? Do you understand that under Jesus, the established rules of right and wrong are not changed, but they are refined and they are blessed by the infusion of God's grace, God's mercy, God's love, and more than that, by the power of His Holy Spirit dwelling within us so that we might accomplish, so that we might do those things that God has commanded us and live our lives before Him in good conscience and realizing that by His grace and living by faith, we are able to please our Father which is in heaven. I am fascinated how in Romans it talks about there's nothing good that can come from the flesh. But then it says that if we yield ourselves to God, if we recognize the right and the proper way of living before Him, we can present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God, which is the act of worship that makes the most sense. So rather than giving up, 
rather than looking at the law of God and saying he couldn't mean that, uh, rather than trying to find a way to justify our actions and break the rules and still think that we can win, there's a need for us to agree with the law of God against ourselves and look to him for grace and mercy that we might live our lives acceptable before him in mercy, in truth, and in love. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you this morning.